to accomplish. And he was expanding his portfolio, so to speak. Well, when you look at verses 19 through 21, Jesus says to the rich young ruler, well, why do you call me good? And Jesus answered, well, no one is good except God alone. And he says to the rich young ruler, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't murder. Don't steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. And he says, well, all these I've kept since I was a boy. And Jesus gives this man the answer he expected. He tells the man to keep the commandments. If you want to know how to successfully earn eternal life, that's it. Keep the commandments. But other than Jesus, no one has successfully pulled that off. Jesus tries to help the man with this response by pointing out that no one is good but God alone, but the man even isn't. The man isn't connecting the dots. And he says in verse 21, I have kept all these since I was a boy. Ironically, he was putting his hope in his religion. His religious rules, his religious rule with keeping him, his religious rule had become his God. Then in verse 22, Jesus drops this bombshell. When Jesus heard him say this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have. Everything. Everything. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when he heard this, he walked away as excited as he could be, because that's exactly what he wanted to hear. Right? Are we excited about reading those things? How many of you have that plaque on your wall, sell everything you have and give it to the poor? Anybody got that plaque on your wall as you walk out the door? I didn't think so. You won't find it in Christian bookstores either. Because you know what? Because it's hard. And the rich young ruler walks away not happy about what he just heard. He thought he had it figured out. Wow. He thought he had it all figured out. He kept all the commandments. He'd been a religious good boy. He had done it since he was a boy. Since he was a boy. And he was excited that Jesus said, hey, keep all the commandments. Then Jesus said, well, that's not it. One more thing. Keeping the Ten Commandments isn't enough. He says, sell everything you have. And when you got a lot of stuff, it's hard to give it away, isn't it? Have you heard of anybody downsizing (laughs) in America very much? Some people do. But the rich young man was successful. He had a lot of stuff, and he knows how to be successful. And salvation was one more trophy he wanted, he wanted to earn. And, you know, the adjective used to describe this man's wealth puts him ahead of almost everybody. And, and in reading, and, and reading the story of the rich young ruler, one might conclude that this is a story about money. But like I said at the very beginning, it's not just a story about money. It's really a story about idolatry and some of the things that we worship. The man was already successful in terms of making money. He also wanted to make sure he was successful religiously. Don't we want to all be successful religiously? I mean, we want want to be successful. We want want to do everything right or try to do everything right. And we make sure we try to do everything right. We make sure everybody else tries to do everything right. You know, we want to be successful religiously. And I don't think there's any one of us in here that doesn't want to be successful in following Christ or or, or being religious. And I believe there's none of us in here who wants to mess, mess our ticket up to go to heaven. All of us in here want to build this impressive resume when we stand before God, don't we? And we got this impressive resume, and we can stand before God, and he can read through it. He said, well, yeah, here, here we go. Hey, Peter, let him in. That guy, man, he's something else. He might be short, but gosh, did you see what he's done on this earth? Man, souls have been saved. People have been changed. All because of him. Peter, let him through. But our idea, as you hopefully caught, our idea of being religiously successful is a little messed up. And like the rich young ruler, I think we spend a lot of time, maybe you don't, a lot of people do. We ask the question that the rich young ruler says, you know, what do I got to do? What do I got to do to have eternal life? 
Is obeying the Ten Commandments enough? Is loving my neighbors enough? Is giving all my money to the poor enough? Is obeying my mom and dad enough? Is loving my spouse enough? None of them by themselves is enough. And doing something is a part of following Christ. I think we got that. And we spent all week doing stuff. But that's not all there is to it. Anybody can do something, but not everybody is willing to step away from all of their stuff, all their achievements, and say, none of this means anything to me. To me, that's a difference in a real Christ follower and those who just, just kind of talk about it. Because those who are real Christ followers, they, they, you know, they, 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 they step away and they, they step away from all their stuff and all their achievements and says, you know, none of this means nothing to me. Look at Abraham. He was willing to give up his only son. Look at Job. He lost everything but, and, but never grew better towards God. Look at Mary who lost her reputation to bring the Son of God into the world. Look at the disciples. They gave, their, they gave up their day jobs to follow him. They gave up everything. They gave up everything, not to be religiously successful, but they gave up everything to follow him. Last week, I introduced you to, you know, Roger Powell, and he's a guy who's coming here in June. He's played professionally basketball in Europe and for the Utah Jazz, and, you know, and I got to have a conversation with him a couple weeks ago, and um, and while he was, he was having a successful professional career and making hundreds and thousands of dollars, and been in his heart, he knew that it wasn't enough as he shares his story. He retired early and gave up his six-figure salary because he wanted to invest his life in young men. Gave up all the money to invest his life in young men. And he shared with me that there was only one university he was willing uh, to give up his career for, and it was Valparaiso. <laughs> that was the only school he was willing to give up because it, 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 it fell in line with what he believed. And sure enough, he, within the next year, he, uh, he prayed and he prayed, and within the next year, the assistant coaching position at Valpo <laughs> opened up. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And you know what? He knew what he had to do. He gave up a six-figure salary to go coach a bunch of 18- and 19-year-old snot-nosed kids who think they own the world. But as he prayed, he knew that the money wasn't enough. And he had other, he had a ministry going, and he loved that. But as he prayed, he, you know, he, as he shared his story with me, he just prayed. He, he said, Lord, I know there's more to this than me. What is it? And he, he shared with me what he prayed. And, and he says, I can't explain it. I don't know why. He says, it, it doesn't make sense to me. But my wife challenged me, so I just kept praying. And soon within the year, this position opens up. He doesn't make six figures anymore. He only makes five figures now. But he was obedient. And now he not only does he teach young men how to play basketball, he gets to influence these young men for eternity because he leads their chapel. You know, and I'm pretty sure God's not, I'm pretty sure, and I'm pretty convinced that God is not concerned with how spiritually or religiously successful you are, and I know he's not concerned with how spiritually or religiously successful I am. Uh, I am. And, you know, success tells me, you know, you, you've introduced a lot of people to Christ over the last 24 years. Success tells me you have influenced a lot of young men for Christ over the last 24 years and lives have been changed because of you. Success tells me you have impacted a lot of people's life for Christ over the last 24 years. Well, what else is there accomplished? What else is there to do? Isn't that enough? Isn't God pleased with me already? Isn't he okay with me? I've done all of these things. Look at me. Look at how great I am. How many youth rallies did you hang out with, go to, in the last 24 years? I did two a year for 17 years, all night. That makes me more spiritual than you, doesn't it? 
Some of you know, those of you who work with young people say, yeah, he's probably right. <laughs> do you hear that? Do you hear, do you hear what success says? Man, hundreds of young people have come to know Christ because of me. Woo-hoo! I got a ticket to heaven, surely. And you don't, because where were you? What are you doing for God? And all, all you're doing is praying? <laughs> well, I've been out in the field working. You know? You see, you hear that? Hear what success says? And folks, those things over the last 24 years is not success. It's called being obedient. And our ideas of success, even in the church world, is about being on top or accomplishing a lot of stuff. And and Jesus, get this, but Jesus points to the downtrodden, the humble, and pure-hearted who refuse to play the world's game of success. That's who Jesus points to. This religious young ruler was really successful religiously. He'd obeyed all the commandments and he'd done everything right and he was feeling good about himself. We like to feel good about ourselves, don't we? And Jesus comes in and says, boom, sell everything. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. And folks, that wasn't a suggestion. And the rich young ruler knew it. You see, success in God's terms is refusing to play the world's games. Because when you refuse to play the world's games, you will be blessed. See, the word success is not not even mentioned in the Bible all that much. And the closest biblical equivalent to the word, uh, the closest biblical equivalent is the word blessed. And, And today in our culture, we use this word as a more humble way of saying, I'm blessed, uh, I'm successful. You know, if we have a lot of stuff in our home, you know, we have these big TVs, nice cars and all that, we say what? We are blessed if we go to church, right? And because we go to church, we got to say we're blessed. You're a Christian, you got to say you're blessed. If we have a lot of money, we, we say what? As Christians now, we say what? We are, we're blessed. You know, if you have a new car, if you're lucky enough to have a new car, well, well what do we say? Oh, well, well. God bless me with this. If we have a new home, we say, well, we are blessed. Let me correct this. No, you are successful. Get what I'm saying? Do you hear the difference? You are successful. Do you see how the gods of success can spiritualize your accomplishments and convince you that you've done enough and convince you that all the stuff you have is from God? Folks, it's not from God. You bought it. Didn't you? Unless you stole it. Did God drop it out of heaven? No, you got the money out or you knew somebody and they gave it to you. You're successful. You know, success is something you have done and accomplished. And get this. Blessed is something God has done or provided when you were completely helpless. Let me repeat that. Success is something you have done and accomplished. Blessed is something God has done or provided when you were completely helpless. Helpless. I have this uh, prayer in my office to remind me that it's not about what I accomplish and, or what I do. And it goes like this. It says, um, this is my prayer. And I live, read it every day. May all my expect, expectations be frustrated. May all my plans be thwarted. May all my desires be withered into nothingness that I may experience the powerlessness and the poverty of a child and sing and dance in the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. It's not about what I accomplish. 
Not about what you accomplish. Not how religious you are. Or how often it's about. I'm about to tell you what it's about. (laughs) Well, then Jesus points out another God of success. The one we don't like to talk about. To the rich young ruler. That he's worshiping and many of us worship, continue worship. And that's money. Yeah, and we need to understand that money is not God in itself, okay? Money becomes a God when you're dependent on it for your security, your significance, and your, and your feeling satisfied. If you've got to have it to feel satisfied or secure and significance, folks, then money is a God in your life. It is. It is a God in your life. If you've got to have those things to feel significant, if you, I mean, you gotta, if you got to have it to feel significant, got to have it to feel secure, or got to have it to feel satisfied, I don't care how much you make, hundreds of thousands or 20,000, it's a God. And Jesus does to this man what he has done to all of us these past few weeks. He puts himself in direct competition with what this man loves the most. And he says, you choose. It's either going to be A, money, B, me, or C, but C, I'm sorry, but C, all the above, is not an option. We choose C, don't we? (laughs) I like C because you had a chance of getting it right. But that's not how it works. You choose. It's going to be A, money, or B, me. But C, all the above is not an option. Jesus put it this way. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. So why is money so often betrayed as God's primary competition? Well, because we look to money to do the very things for us that God wants to do. And these are the lies that we've believed. And here are the lies that the God of money tells us. Number one, money will satisfy you. If only I had enough of it. Raise your hand if you think you have enough money. Yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, we we always want more, right? Because we're afraid of that rainy day, something's going to happen. And really, a rainy day really never comes. You know? And if we only had enough of it, we think happiness will come. And we've decided that the phrase, money won't make you happy, is something rich people have made up to keep the rest of us from being miserable. <laughs> and we can never have enough of it. We say, if we only made more money, we would, could do this and we would give more to the church. Folks, if you're not giving now, if you get more money, you're not going to give then. It's true. We are creatures of habit. I have a lot of people. I had people, the church I was at before here would say, boy, if I only had more money, I would give more to the church. If I won the lottery, real things people have said, if I won the lottery, lottery, I had tied 10% of it to the church. And I say, are you doing it now? Because if you're not doing it now, and I've said this, and people don't like me, that's all right. I said, if you're not doing it now, you're not going to do it then. And we all, and here's the reality it doesn't make a difference how much money you make or don't make, it will never make you happy. When will we learn that? The second lie we believe, and a lot of us believe, I'm not saying you believe this, but there's some people who believe this. Money means that you matter. You know, we think, you know, we look at the Donald Trumps and the Mark Cubans and the Warren Buffetts and all these people that have billions and billions of dollars that we'll never see in our lifetime. You know, we think that money makes us significant. We, and we often judge our worth by how much we are monetarily worth, don't we? And instead of looking to God as our source of identity, we look to money a lot of times. Oh, man, I don't have this. I don't have enough of this. And, you know, God, you tell me. God, if I just give me win the lottery, my life would be so much better. God, no, 
Oh God, I just want to matter. Just give me more money. I'll matter. I really will matter. I'll do something grand for you if you just let me have, pick the right, what is it, six or seven numbers? And we connect that, don't we? And we do that. We might not say that, but we do do it. Those who have more money are obviously more important. Well, not in the kingdom of God. The third lie we believe a lot about money is that it'll make you secure. (laughs) The truth is that whatever you put your security in ends up being your God. It reveals where you put your hope. With enough money, with enough money, God doesn't need seem all that necessary, right? And those of you who happen to make a lot of money, you know, you know that it, those of you, you, it ends up it ends up being a God, and it reveals where you put your hope and. And, you know, it says, you know, God doesn't seem necessary because, you know, we wrongfully assume that we have enough, if we can have enough or save enough, you know, to care for ourselves, you know, God wouldn't have to worry about me. And we believe that lie. The fourth lie, money will save you, oh, my stars. You see, the real problem with idolatry is that we look to something other than Jesus for salvation. You know, we're lonely and we look to relationships for salvation. We're empty and we look to possessions for salvation. We're depressed and we look to food for salvation. We're rejected and we look to pornography for salvation. We're angry and we look to alcohol for salvation. We're apathetic and we look to our work for salvation. We're proud and we look, to our, we look to our status for salvation. We're worried and we look to money for our salvation. Folks, we do that. And it becomes, and it becomes a God. Not that we want it to be a God. I don't think anybody, I think all of us in here are Christ followers. Says, Boy, if I ask you to raise your hand, you know, who, who wants to follow God and God alone? Most of us, I believe, would raise our hand and say, yes, I want God alone. Jesus is enough for me. And then something comes along. And it's put to the test. Let me take care of this and I'll be right back. You know? And we try to see what must I do to inherit eternal life. Well, I got to fix this. I got to fix this about my, I got I to gotta fix this. Instead of getting on our knees and begging God to bring healing in our life. We got to fix it. And God says, no, humble yourself. Get down on your knees and beg for me to show up in your life. But Lord, I can fix. No. But Lord, no. But Lord, no. Every but you have, he says, no. And he says, humble yourself, get on your knees and beg for my mercy. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. I am weak. You know, if you have a lot of money, you really don't have to worry about it. You just go buy something. Right? Make you feel good about yourself. Isn't that what we do? In fact, psychologists used to train us. Have you ever been to one? Never been to one. You know, so you could feel good about yourself. You know, if you ever, ever experienced that, they would tell you, hey, you know, go buy something for yourself so you would feel good about yourself. That doesn't solve any problem. The real problem is a heart issue. There's idols that we're worshiping, and we don't even realize it. Millard Fuller tells of becoming a millionaire by the age of 29. <laughs> he said he'd, he had bought his wife everything she could possibly want. But one day he came home to a note that announced that she had left him. Millard uh, went after her. He found her on a Saturday night at a hotel in New York City. 
They talked into the wee hours of the morning as she poured out her heart and, and made him see that the things that our society says are supposed to be so satisfying had left her cold. Her heart was empty and her spirit was burned out. She was dead inside and wanted to live again. Kneeling at their bedside in that hotel room, Millard and Linda decided to sell everything they had and dedicate themselves to serving the poor. The next day, being Sunday, they found the nearest church and went there to worship and thank God for their new beginning. And they shared with the minister and told him about what had happened to them and the decision they'd made. The minister told them that such a radical decision was not really necessary. And Millard said, he told us that it was not necessary to give up everything. He just didn't understand that we weren't giving up money and the things that money could buy. We were giving up, period. See, Millard and Linda started an organization, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with, called Habitat for Humanity. And folks, the story points out it's not about giving up money and things. It's not about being religiously successful. It's about giving up, period. That's what deny yourself means, giving up, period. Did you catch that? And I think, boy, if we can catch that, as Christ followers, it's not about giving up something or giving up an amount of money. It's about giving up, period, and becoming as helpless as a child. Because when we're helpless, that's when we recognize God the most. Am I right? In those moments when you have felt helpless, who'd you cry out to? Oh, $100 bill fall from the sky and make me happy. No, who did you cry out to? Somebody say the word. God. You didn't cry out to your cell phone. You didn't cry out to your bank account or your car or your house. When you were helpless, you knew in your mind and heart that those things could not help you. Am I right? All of a sudden, it didn't matter what kind of car you drove, what kind of house you own, what kind of money you make or don't make. All of a sudden, when you felt helpless, God shows up. And what do you do? You cry out to him, have mercy on me, God. I have no idea what to do or where to turn. And you give up. Period. Folks, this is not about money. This is not about being religiously successful. This is about giving up. And the rich young ruler could not give up. He couldn't choose. And folks, what did we learned last week when you can't choose, what do we remain? We remain silent. Because we want them both. Jesus says you need to choose. That's what he was saying to the rich young ruler. Choose. Which is it going to be? Me? Religious success or money, but you can't have all the above. It's not an option. And when you try to serve one, you despise the other. When you despise one, you serve the other. 
Pretty straightforward. And this morning, are you going to walk away sad today? <laughs> Have you ever asked the question, why don't I experience the joy of the Lord each and every day? Have you ever asked yourself that question? It's a good question to ask. Because if you're not experiencing the joy of the Lord every day, there's some idols that need to die. And it could be these two. And the little boy is singing to me, I forgot who it was, Brandon. You want to sing that song? Smash his face. It's a kid's song, but it has powerful truth. If you want to experience joy, give up, period.
on that night Jesus was betrayed, he took his body and he broke it, and he said, take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And he took a cup. He said, this is my blood. This represents my blood. He said, take and drink and do this in remembrance of me. Father, thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you for invading our lives today. May we never be the same. God, may we honor you in all that we do and say and think and feel. And Lord, give us the freedom to cry for help. 